Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dan Rayburn. We're still letting some folks log in. Um, give it another minute or so. I just want to let everyone know that this is being recorded today, um, and I have started recording at, at 1 o'clock, but we'll just give it a, another minute or so to allow folks to log on. All right, well, we're gonna think we'll get going here. Um, again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a meeting for um, the Navigation Ecosystem Sustainability Program, Forest Management. Um, in particular, we're gonna be going over the uh, update to the appendix. Um, slide. This is kind of the meeting agenda, a formal agenda was sent out in the calendar invite, but again, um, for sign in purposes, if everyone could go into the chat and just type in your name, title and organization in the chat, we'll use that as a, a sign in um, for this meeting. Again, this meeting will be recorded and shared after after it's over. Um, and just want to make sure everyone's uh, clear the the four the, the discussion we're having is on the uh, update to the appendix and the four topics um, that we're going to mainly be talking about is the NESP Forest Management Authority. Um, then there's going to be a programmatic environmental assessment talk, a systemic forest stewardship appendix update discussion, and then um, the appendix review process. And um, at this time, if you could. If, if questions do come up, if you could put them in the chat and they'll be answered in the order they received, the order they received. we'll have uh, um, core folks monitoring the chat um, and can um, bring up your question um, when, 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 when the time makes sense. And, and um, there will be um, budgeted time at the end of this meeting to have an open, open uh, questions brought up and, and discussion. So with that, I think we will start with our first topic, um, NESP Management Authority. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jill Bathke. I work in the St. Paul District um, and I am the NESP planner. So I work exclusively on NESP, um, working on the planning of these ecosystem type studies and um, in various coordination aspects with um, our partner agencies. Um, and I just want to give a brief overview of what the NEST program is. And I guess first off, uh, for those that might be unfamiliar, NEST stands for the Navigation Ecosystem and Sustainability Program. Um, that was authorized by Congress in 2007. Um, and we've just recently you know, been getting going here on this program. And it's a really unique program on the upper Mississippi River that integrates both navigation improvements on the upper Mississippi River along with ecosystem restoration. And because of that dual purpose, it has two different goals to increase the reliability of navigation and then restoring, protecting and enhancing the environment. And really it's that number two that we would be here to talk about today. So we're not here to talk about navigation. We're here to talk about the restoration side of the navigation and ecosystem sustainability program or NESP. Um, so if you see on the right hand of your screen, those are all the active projects on the upper Mississippi River. It also kind of shows the area that we're talking about today. 
um, and, and there's many different projects that are in planning or construction or design at this time. Um, and if you want to find out more information about NESP, that website is the place to go. Um, and I will also add that in the chat here shortly. Hey, Jill, Andy, this is Nathan. Real quick. Um, can everybody hear us out there? I see maybe Tim Miller was having trouble hearing. Is everybody getting the audio? I'm hearing you guys well. I just want to check with others. Yeah, it's all good. All right, great. Thanks. Thank you. And if Tim, if you're missing audio too, it is going to be recorded so we can make sure to get to you that way as well. Um, the NESP ecosystem restoration program. So the, the ecosystem restoration side, this was authorized by Congress and there's various components of it and it, it can kind of be confusing. And so I just wanted to break down all the different components just to make sure everyone is aware of the part of NESP that we're talking about specifically today. So, what was authorized under this ecosystem restoration program was 225 different projects over 15 years. And Congress basically said, you know, find the best places to do this type of restoration work. Um, although they did give us a few specific locations and a few specific projects that we would need to do. Um, but it really left about 206 projects to be identified and planned up and down the Mississippi River in the upper part. Um, also authorized was land acquisition in the lower part of the Missis upper Mississippi River. So to acquire that land and then do restoration work on it. Um, and systemic adaptive management of the river. And then the last item, which is the focus of today's discussion, is the funding for forest stewardship. Um, and there's also a component for cultural resources mitigation and management stewardship, um, but that's another different item. So if we go to the next slide, um, there's a very busy table, but I think what I can just want people to focus in on is that forest management line. Um, and so we are authorized to do various forest management work. That's what we're talking about today on the upper Mississippi River on federal lands. And we were authorized to do this um, at a cost of about $38 million over 15 years. Um, and so those are the actions we're covering today. There's also another component of NEST. I talked about that ecosystem management. Um, and so there's many other um, important restoration actions the Corps is working on along with our partners to plan and construct on the upper Mississippi River. So that's that blue dot, that ecosystem management. Um, and there's a whole host of really good things and restoration work we're doing. That's just not what we're talking about today. Um, and you can check out our website for more information on all of those items. And Dan, next slide. So what Ness envisioned, and there's much, many different documents kind of describe this again on the Corps website. You can take a look at those. It's a stewardship element under the navigation and ecosystem restoration program. So it's management of the existing forests of that that is owned by the federal government. So there's funding for forest inventory, floodplain elevation data and research, and then just general management. Um, under NESP, there's also those also the, the good restoration actions that we can undertake on the upper Mississippi River. So floodplain restoration is one of them. Um, so we still might be working um, in the floodplain forest under the NESP program, but that's a completely different category. Today, again, it's only talking about that stewardship element and that management of existing forest resources. Um, so I'll pause here. That was kind of the overview that we wanted to give of NEST today, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them or we can hold them to later too. Hey, Jill, I see one question in the chat regarding uh, federal lands, and I think we're going to get to that in this um, map. So if you just want to hold on, I think we'll answer your question. And if you've got questions after that, let's chat a little bit more. And I see Sarah asked a similar question and we'll get to that. All right, I'm Leanne Glomsky and I am doing the environmental compliance review for the programmatic environmental assessment. Um, the Council on Environmental Quality Regulations encourages development of program level NEPA documents 
when projects are similar to each other or have similar impacts, agencies can then tear off of that program level NEPA document to avoid duplication and delay. Um, the purpose of the systemic forestry PEA is to provide um, an environmental review for the implementation of forest management activities that are authorized by NASP. Um, it evaluates both the potential effects of forest management activities authorized by NESP, as well as the no action alternative. Uh, the potential impacts are evaluated programmatically and consider conditions that can be encountered at various sites. It does not focus on specific parcels, and that's a key um, point for a programmatic environmental assessment. With that, though, site-specific evaluations still need to be completed for compliance for the Clean Water Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, Endangered Species Act, as well as other laws. Next slide. The scope of the forest management activities covered by the PEA is limited to 100% federal lands, and again, we'll explain that later on in the presentation. Um, USACE will document when projects and their associated impacts are determined to have been addressed sufficiently under the PEA. Um, for project types described within the PEA that require additional site-specific NEPA analysis, um, we would conduct additional focused environmental assessments. Projects that will typically require a tiered NEPA document or um, commonly referred to as a supplemental environmental assessment are projects identified by the Corps as having effects that weren't sufficiently evaluated under the PEA, such as those that may require a permanent facility or supporting structure or changes in land use. Um, it would also mean that we would do uh, pro for pro a supplemental EA for projects that would have adverse effects to federally endangered and threatened species and or uh, adverse effects to historic properties. The PEA does not cover projects that require land acquisition or projects that occur on non-federal lands. Next slide. This is just a summary list of the activities that are addressed in the programmatic environmental assessment, um, stand manipulation, site preparation, planting, seeding, um, prescribed burns, and then invasive species management invasive species management, which could include um, chemical applications, mechanical control, biological control. Um, we also have the ability to um, do some wildlife habitat enhancement activities. And then we had supporting activities, and these are mainly um, activities that would allow us like temporary access to and from a proposed site. Next slide. So the process that would take place under the programmatic environmental assessment is that foresters will develop uh, detailed site level forest management prescriptions and submit those to the appropriate district office for environmental compliance review. So the foresters that sit up here in uh, St. Paul district, they would work with the environmental compliance team here in St. Paul. Uh, for each prescription, a memo will be completed to document full environmental compliance. Uh, in St. Paul, we refer to this memo as an environmental compliance review, but um, other districts may call it something else. Uh, in cases where area specific actions or their impacts have not been fully addressed under the PEA or have changed, um, we would then conduct a supplemental, re supplemental review, which uh, would include a supplemental environmental assessment. So I think that wraps up Leanne's uh, discussion on, on the programmatic EA topic. Does anybody have questions for Leanne on that before we move on? This is Andrew Stevenson with UMRBA. Um, <clears throat> Leanne, if you could uh, maybe clarify again, or, or I don't know if I caught it, um, that the stewardship, the forest stewardship plan could do some additional activities that aren't addressed in the list that you showed if there was a supplemental uh, EA done? 
Yes, that's possible. Okay. And I think it, it's important yeah, to note that the that the list that Leanne showed is just a is just a subset of the of the management actions that are included in in the programmatic EA. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, one of the things that I don't know when uh, this will come up specifically, but um, we we I was looking at the document that you sent out the the supplemental report and um, it goes into the elevation modification that that's not an action that can be covered under that um is that is that something that would need a supplemental is it something that's possible to do with a supplemental ea or is that does that fall outside the bounds of the stewardship that program? that falls outside of the bounds of the systemic forestry uh pea so the pea is only it's going it won't cover any dirt moving activities like dredging or Adjusting elevations. Okay. Thanks. And I guess I'll add to that, Andrew, the general thought is, you know, if we get into, you know, significant earth moving or, or island construction or things of that nature, even though they may have a, a very forestry heavy focus, those would follow the like the PIR process we're doing for ecosystem restoration type projects. Um, so the focus here is kind of the traditional forest management activities, if that makes sense. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Oh. Hey, this is Brian Hopkins with the Nature Conservancy. I'm not trying to be combative on this. It's more of a long standing conversation that a lot of people have had around this. So we're dealing with forest decline and changing hydrology. And so being able to address elevation in order to reverse decline or actually move towards um, healthier, more diverse systems is kind of, it's a, it, it needs to be in the toolbox. I understand that structurally it's being separated from this uh, versus individual projects, but um, I wonder what the thought process, I mean, because everybody in the room understands that if we can coordinate those two activities, we'd end up with a, a better objective goal. So I wonder what the thought process is there. This is this is Andy Meyer. I can take a stab at that. Maybe Jill, if, if you want to um, follow up and maybe clarify anything that I that I maybe misspeak. I think one of the one of the primary intents of the systemic forest stewardship um, uh, program under NESP is to extend, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit in my in my my following slides, but it's to extend the operational forest management that's 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 being done uh, currently on the on the river. And and I completely concur. There are a lot of areas where um, where elevation and um, hydrologic changes have led to significant declines in the forest. Um, but at the same time, there are thousands of acres of forest that are not uh, subject to um, flood mortality or, or other hydrologic issues that, are, that can be addressed by uh, elevation modification, but are instead subject to invasive species or loss of elm and ash due to non-native pests or uh, failures to regenerate that we don't really understand. And so the intent of the systemic forest stewardship component of NESP is to be able to really focus on those areas where we, uh, where we have other management issues where we can actually, where we can actually take advantage of higher elevation sites within the, within the floodplain to, uh, to, to restore and maintain those less, um, hydrologically stressed forest areas. And the elevation modification remains an option within the NESP, uh, the ecosystem restoration component of NESP. It, it simply uh, needs to be uh, incorporated into that side of the program to, in order for, for it to be a piece of a project. Yeah, that's correct. And I just wanted to add on a little bit to the last thing Andy just said and address kind of something Sarah had asked in the in the comments there, um, if there's a process for coordination between um, the NESP ecosystem side of the projects and then the stewardship forest effort. Um, and yes, that, that is something that we're working on developing. So the core is working on developing a reach based planning process for the entire UMR under NESP. 
Um, and so we're working on how those can these two teams can be talking to each other and making sure that we're incorporating um, best information and knowledge of where we're working on the Mississippi River to really build upon the restoration potential of both of these actions. Um, and Matt, I, I see you also had a question about the two actions and could they occur on the same footprint? And I think that's something um, that would really need to be a site specific, um, uh, something that we would need to decide on a site specific basis. Um, there are potentially some systemic forest actions that could occur um, within the same footprint, um, but the timing and making sure that the benefits achieved by both of these, both of those actions are realized and that we're providing um, an important and, and, and wisely spending the federal investment on the, those areas. I mean, those are things that we'll have to consider, um, but we would like, you know, teams to really think about where is that on the ecosystem size, where is the greatest restoration potential to meet reach based needs? And I believe that's exactly what the foresters will be doing on this side. Hey, I think it's you, Andrew. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Um, uh, Jill, I guess in relationship to the reach planning process, um, and I know this is the systemic forest stewardship specifically today, but um, you know, last week there was an in-water placement uh, workshop in St. Paul that focused on sediment material that <clears throat> I think many people that are on this call were on that call uh, or at that workshop. And it just seems like NESP is one of those, you know, the rare opportunities that we have um, and the intent of the program to really coordinate across both the navigation and ecosystem aspects of management on the river. And so I don't know if it's within the reach planning process or um, at what stage, but, you know, there's identified a number of, you know, chronic dredging areas and how do we think about the opportunities we have through beneficial use and, and placement, either thin layer placement um, in some of our forest areas. And so as we look to identify some of these priority areas, maybe it's not through the systemic forest stewardship plan, but it's through our, our regional foresters as they're identifying those priority areas and uh, and advancing those through, um, you know, the, the other ecosystem project identification process so that we can think about, um, you know, how best to coordinate all of our, our river management on ecosystem and navigation. And that is something definitely we're continuing to talk about and developing the framework for continuing to figure out how we share information across um, NESP and making sure that those lines of communication and opportunities for restoration potential are achieved. Um, so definitely I agree with you, Andrew, and some of that is things that we're still continuing to develop and the frameworks um, expanded. Jill, this is Matt Mangan. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, land acquisition was not going to be part of the EA. Um, if, but if an agency acquires lands, um, uh, could this program be utilized to like plant trees and restore the site or is that better done through like a, the PIR and restoration side of the program over? Um, that's a really great question, Matt. Um, I think that's one we would have to consider and get back to you on. Thanks. Any other well, questions? Go ahead. I'll go, go ahead, go ahead well, I was going to say if there's any other questions on kind of the, the programmatic EA topic. Otherwise, I think, Angie, you're up to yep. talk a little bit. So go ahead. I, I have a question about the EA. This is Joe Jordan in Rock Island. And Leanne, what is your schedule? Is Has there been public review? Is that scheduled? When will the document be implemented? Uh, currently don't have a complete schedule just yet. Um, because the PEA covers all three districts, we are planning to do uh, DQC or district quality control um, with all three districts. And Office of Council 
review at all three districts prior for prior to it be going to be going out for public review. So maybe so we, fingers we crossed. have a little bit of ways to go yet. Okay, maybe at the end of the fiscal year, maybe I'm not putting you in a corner or anything, but maybe sometime this year. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I can get started then on um, on my section here. And um, Dan, am I able to, if I click next page, am I able to advance slides here for everybody? Yep, you are the presenter. Okay, okay. so people can see that when I'm moving back and forth here? Yep. yep. All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, my name is Andy Meyer. I'm the lead forester for the Corps of Engineers in the St. Paul District out of our La Crescent, Minnesota field office. Um, and I'm part of the planning team that's been developing the uh, the systemic forest, forest stewardship, uh, what we've been calling the appendix. Um, we're now kind of calling it a supplemental or an implementation supplemental report. So I'll probably end up using uh, using those terms interchangeably here, and and probably they're interchangeable on these slides, um, just because we've been a little bit in flux in terms of what that exact name is. Um, but I'm, I'm going to take the lion's share of the time here today and just kind of walk through um, walk through a lot of the details of that of that document. I think what I what I uh, what I ask is that um, I, I will pause periodically throughout what I'm presenting and take questions as I'm kind of going from one section to the next. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd ask that if you can just wait until I pause to take questions just so that I can make sure that I get through. Um, get through my slides here. Um, I do have a tendency sometimes to ramble myself, so uh, uh, we don't want to we don't want to keep on going forever. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to give kind of a brief overview of the background of of why we're why we're doing this um, this appendix or this implementation supplemental report. Um, a lot of the details that I think um, a few have asked about already. Um, I'll try to address those in 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 that in that discussion um, and. Kind of talk about the process and and how we envision this going forward um, so the real kind of the, the basic background of this entire process um, is is based on a couple of key documents uh, a lot of people on the call are familiar with the 2004 integrated feasibility report for uh for nesp as a whole um, as part of that uh as part of the initial nesp planning funding back uh, in the early 2000s uh, the a group within across the three districts, in, including uh, Corps of Engineers, Operations Foresters, and the, the state and Fish and Wildlife Service, and a number of other entities, um, were tasked with developing uh, a systemic forest stewardship plan to guide implementation of NASP systemic forestry at that point in time. Um, however, when uh, the uh, NASP appropriations um, or when the NESP authorization didn't lead to NESP appropriations and the, and the funding for planning um, ran out, that systemic forest stewardship plan was finished up with, um, with operational funding um, and completed in, in 2012. And that systemic stewardship plan um, has really been kind of the, kind of the, the document that has joined uh, together a number of different managers on the river in terms of forest management objectives. Um, but with the uh, reawakening of NESP and over the last few years, uh, the next step of that process uh, was began to develop this implementation supplemental report um, to define some of the processes associated with uh, with the management goals and objectives identified in the Upper, upper Mississippi River Systemic Forest Stewardship Plan. And so, some of the details of the Systemic Stewardship Plan, um, as I said, it was developed as phase one of the 2005 project management plan under NESP for systemic forest management. Um, and it is, it is a direct output of that initial NESP funding in the early 2000s and was developed with really close coordination with the, the original NESP planning team. Um, and as I said before, uh, because the planning dollars um, were used up uh, prior to completion of the systemic forest stewardship plan, the uh, operations uh, operations forest foresters within the individual districts allocated operations dollars to complete the systemic forest stewardship plan in, in 2012. Um, and at that point in time, because of the uncertainty of future NESP appropriations, the systemic forest stewardship plan 
was really designed, instead of being directly a NESP-oriented document, to provide kind of more overarching general guidance for forest management on all ownerships within the UMR system. And so because of that sort of slight shift in, in framework due to the uncertainty of NESP funding coming through, um, some components that are currently in the systemic forest stewardship plan may not be uh, specifically authorized components within NESP systemic forest stewardship. Um, and so that's an important caveat because um, as, I'm, as I go through these slides here, there will be some things that, um, that may be included in the systemic stewardship plan that, that might be relevant to other authorities but may not be specifically relevant to NESP. Um, and I, I think another really important thing to point out is that a lot of the, uh, the systemic forest stewardship plan goals, objectives, and criteria have been incorporated into other agency planning documents, including specifically um, Corps of Engineers master plans for recreation and natural resources management on the UMR, as well as uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, habitat management plans for refuges uh, on the river. I know for sure for the upper Miss Mississippi River National Wildlife and Fish Refuge and perhaps other refuges farther down river. Uh, need to remember to click the next arrow rather than use my keys on the keyboard. Um, so the, upper, the systemic stewardship plan identifies a number of system-wide goals. Um, and these are system-wide goals that are based off of the original NESP uh, ecosystem goals that were developed in the, with the initial NESP planning. Um, kind of, these are very big picture goals without a lot of detail. Functional, sustainable floodplain ecosystem, including mosaic of native vegetation communities, sufficient to, import wild, uh, to support important wildlife habitat. Um, restore and maintain forest diversity, health, and sustainability on, on federal lands. Uh, provide support for the restoration and maintenance of forest diversity, health, and sustainability on non-federal lands. And you'll see I have a footnote there. Um, again, this is one of those instances where the uncertainty of funding at the time the systemic stewardship plan was completed um, allowed for the inclusion of non-federal lands within that document. But as Jill mentioned earlier, uh, that the deeper uh, dive into the authorities within NESP um, has led to the conclusion that systemic NESP systemic forest stewardship is um, exclusively for federal lands um, uh, within the Mississippi River floodplain or within the nine foot navigation channel footprint. And I know there's a question hanging out there about what is federal and non-federal. I will get to that in a couple slides here. Um, and then adaptive management is, is, a, is another key component of the systemic forest stewardship plan. Um, one of the key things that the systemic forest stewardship plan does do is provide a set of uh, desired forest conditions. Um, and these are identified at sort of a stand level, uh, you know, the level of a couple hundred acres maybe, and also at the landscape level. Um, and later on in, in my slides, I'll talk a little bit about some important data needs to update these, these uh, desired forest conditions. But for the time being, um, this is a key component of the systemic forest stewardship plan that it actually provides some, some guidance in terms, of, in terms of management criteria and targets that we, that we can start aiming for as part of, uh, as part of future management planning. Um, the systemic stewardship plan also provides a set of recommended priority actions, um, and I'm not going to read through each one of these. These are these are 10 years old, and things have changed. Um, but a key a key thing here is three out of the four items here are actually data acquisition and data management related uh, actions. One of them is related to um, prioritization of on the ground actions, and I think one thing that's really important to emphasize as part of the systemic stewardship plan and ultimately as part of the direction of NESP systemic forest stewardship. Um, management actions are a key priority, but acquisition of data and data development and development of management tools to support effective floodplain forest management are equally important. And so one of the major goals of, of systemic forest stewardship is to learn how to do things better um, because we, we really have a lot to learn yet with floodplain forest restoration and management. So I will finish with this. Well, I'll do this slide and then, and then open it up for, for a few questions before moving on to the next, onto the next section. Um, and so there could probably be a question, why are we developing a, uh, a supplemental report for implementation of a systemic forest stewardship under NEST? We already have the systemic forest stewardship plan. 
Um, and really, the uh, the primary re there there are a few primary reasons. Um, again, the as I said before, the systemic stewardship plan was designed to be an overarching document that could provide guidance for funding authorities and agencies outside of the NESP framework due to the uncertainty of NESP appropriations at that point in time. Um, and actually within the systemic forest stewardship plan itself, um, it, it, it defines the need for, uh, for a more detailed implementation process, uh, which is not specifically spelled out within the systemic forest stewardship plan. Um, and then a lot has just changed in, in 12 years since the systemic forest stewardship plan was, was initially developed. Um, and so critical new data sets are available, data management processes have been developed, um, and drastic impacts of river variability of, of over the past decade require creative approaches to management. And so, um, and so this uh, implementation supplemental report that, that, we're, that we're now presenting is kind of that next step in the process to go from the overarching ideas of this, the systemic forest stewardship plan uh, to actual implementation. Um, and so I will leave it, I will take a pause there and just see if there are any questions related to um, the systemic forest stewardship plan and the need for um, the supplemental in implementation report. All right, hearing none, I will move on to kind of the next session section in which in which I'll talk a little bit more about the authority and what the what the program actually actually entails. Um, so this this slide actually um, is a little bit of a rehash from one of Jill's slides, but that's intentional. Um, these are important things to to re to reemphasize. Um, this is a slightly different image of the uh, of the of the footprint of the NESP systemic forest stewardship. Uh, program um, and what you can see is it basically encompasses the entire Upper Mississippi River system within the nine foot navigation channel project and parts of the Illinois River and um, small portions of uh, of other tributaries that that are part of the the nine foot navigation channel project. Um, I think what's really important to emphasize and we've talked about this a little bit already because it's a stewardship element under NEST that uh, that um, allows for the ability to extend the, the operational forest management processes that are currently in place, rather than um, rather than creating uh, rather than really creating a new, a completely new set of processes and teams to to implement implement this program. It's it's sort of an extension of the of the program. That's the programs that are already in place. Um, as Jill mentioned, it's management of existing forest resources. I've got a couple more slides later to, to, to re-emphasize that. Um, I think really important, and I've, I've mentioned this already, it's funding for forest inventory, floodplain elevation data, and research, as well as implementation. Um, and so, the, so the, the tools that we need to make better management decisions are, are a component of, of, the, of the funding. Um, and then, again, 100% federal cost implemented on federal lands. I think I have another slide where I talk a little bit more about the federal lands question. Um, and if, if I don't get to that in a couple of slides, I'll probably pause and just we'll just talk through that um, uh, separately here. Um, and again, uh, man forest restoration actions that are broader than standard forest management are authorized, but not within the systemic forest stewardship component of NESP, but in, within the ecosystem restoration component of, of NESP, and that will require different planning coordination requirements. Um, and so the, the footprint of that, of the systemic forest stewardship program is within the 500 year floodplain of the UMAR on all, all federal lands. Um, actually, I will just address that federal lands question right here, because I'm not sure if I have another slide that, that, um, that does it better. Um, and so um, the the intent with uh, systemic forest stewardship is that any federal land for which a federal agency has forest management responsibilities um, is considered part of the uh, NESP systemic forest stewardship uh, program. And so 
This would include lands that may be managed by another entity for wildlife or other for public use, but to which the Corps of Engineers maintains or a federal, another federal agency maintains fee title ownership and forest management rights on those, on those lands. So um, the vast majority of Corps of Engineers fee title lands within the upper Mississippi River are managed under some sort of an agreement with another agency in which another agency is allowed or granted management responsibilities for certain components of that, but the Corps of Engineers retains, um, retains forest management rights. And then other federal lands that are, uh, that, are, that are fee title lands and owned by another federal agency are also considered to be federal lands as part of, um, as part of the NEST Systemic Forest Stewardship Program. Um, there are still some little pieces of, of how exactly all of that works that we're working out. Um, and we probably don't have every answer quite yet, but, but basically in any case where a federal agency has forest management responsibilities and rights on, on the land, it's, it is considered part of the systemic forest stewardship authorization. Does that, does that help answer any of the questions about, about what's considered federal land as part of this program? I see All Vanessa right, has her hand up. All... Vanessa oh. Perry has her hand up. Yeah, thanks, Andy. This does um, that does help, and I uh, appreciate you providing a um, a clear definition. And I'm just wondering if you have a version of the map we're looking at now that shows the project area that is narrowed down to the um, properties or lands that you just described as like qualifying as federal lands. I was just hunting around for that like two days ago. We, each of the core of engineers districts has, um, as part of our ma master planning process, um, we develop a, what's called a land allocation land classification plan um, that delineates um, delineates the the uh, ownership and and um, land classification within the entire UMR. But I don't believe that we actually have those those pieced together for each. Uh, from each one of the districts, each one of the districts has their own um, has a separate version, and there may be a piece together version out there. Um, I can definitely get you the link to where the the online web map for um, St. Paul district is, and we will follow up. That's that's a high priority to follow up and, and make sure that we get um, that we get kind of that um, system wide map together. The data is there; it just may not all be in one place quite yet. All right, well, I'll keep on moving. If people still have questions about that, we can, we can obviously circle back to them at the, at the end here. Um, I think a really important thing to talk a little bit about is what standard forest management actually means. Um, Andrew, you kind of, you, you asked that question a little bit earlier and, um, and um, we had addressed it a little bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll provide maybe a little bit more context in terms of what that, what that actually means. Um, so within the systemic stewardship plan, there are a list of uh, what were referenced to as uh, potential forest management tools. And a lot of these things are things that people have probably seen before. Timber stand improvement, which is a very general term. Um, timber harvesting is included in the systemic forest stewardship plan and different, um, different silvicultural systems to implement that. Uh, forest site preparation, forest establishment, which is what we kind of uh, a term, broad term for getting trees growing on a site again, um, prescribed burning. Within the systemic stewardship plan, elevation modification and water level management are also included as, as, um, as potential components. But again, that gets back to the, um, the issue that the systemic forest stewardship plan was developed to be relevant to multiple authorities. And those, those pieces do remain um, potential under other authorities. Um, timber harvesting uh, has, is, is uh, a complex process and, and the, the, the logistical components of that, that um, and real estate components associated with that make it not feasible to implement under, um, under the NEST program. Um, and then of course the elevation water level, man elevation modification water level management components are sort of more in that ecosystem management or ecosystem restoration um, realm. And so again, 
authorized but not under um, not under systemic forest stewardship. Um, to get more specific though about what standard forest management really means in the context of systemic forest stewardship, um, there, there are a couple a couple kind of uh, bullets that I'd or a couple of sort of really short definitions that I'd use. Um, one would be simply actions that are uni uniformly accepted within the forest management profession as as standard forest management. Um, a lot of uh, there there are a lot of things that we do on a regular basis that are that are uh, standard forest management, but things like dredging, placing material are are not uh, are not things that are included in um, any standard silvicultural uh, guidebook. Um, and those practices are practices that are described within any standard silviculture textbook. Any any forester who um, who has gets a forester degree is going to have a silviculture class, and within that textbook, there's going to be a list of you know a couple dozen silvicultural forest or forest management techniques, silvicultural prescriptions that that are generally considered to be standard across the profession. Um, and Leanne presented a presented a, a list of a few of the uh, of a, a few of the management. Uh, the standard forest management prescriptions that are included in the programmatic EA. I have a few more listed here below. Um, note that this is definitely not an exhaustive list, and exhaustive list, and um, there are dozens and dozens of the standard forest management prescriptions within within um, within the programmatic EA, and that will be potentially implemented within under the systemic forest stewardship program. Um, but it basically ranges from things like tree planting and seeding of tree seedlings to site preparation to prepare a site for um, tree planting or regeneration treatments. It includes things like non-commercial thinning, so uh, instances where we may be um, where we may be uh, wanting to thin out the canopy to um, to improve growth conditions for some desirable tree species that are being outcompeted. Or instances where we may want to uh, deaden some trees that that may have a, a pest problem. Oak wilt would be a good example where um, where killing trees may be good to prevent the spread of a disease um, and other thinning options. Um, invasive species control is is a really important component of this. Pretty much all of the uh, many of the sites that that would be covered under this program are um, are include um, uh, significant Invasive pest um, components to them. So um, those are those are a range of the management prescriptions. But once the programmatic EA comes up for review, um, the the full list will be available there, and I'm I'm sure that we can um, we can provide more feedback on on the on specific prescriptions if if there if there are questions. Um, any questions on forest management actions? Hey, Andy, uh, Sarah Schmucker had a, a question in the chat. It's regarding the, the implementation report. And you know, we actually talked about this earlier today where we, we do have a little discrepancy in there on the, on the O&M language. Um, so I guess Sarah, in in short, yeah, we understand that there's a discrepancy in there. That's something we we yeah was brought to our attention already. We need to clarify that. I would say in general terms, and Andy, jump in if if I'm wrong. I we don't see there being this big O and M component to this, um, but we've got to we've got to get you guys a more I guess a little bit more definitive answer on on what that would entail if if by chance there was something that was considered on Um I think there's still this thought of hypothetically, maybe there could be, and I think we need to try to tighten that up a little. Andy, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say that, you know, generally speaking for forest management actions, the way that we, we would like to design them for systemic forest stewardship is that the NESP Systemic forest stewardship funding is able to cover all the components of the establishment phase of any of any management action, and you know, in the forest management world, um, the you know the objectives are, of our management may not be achieved for a hundred years, and so O and M just has a very different flavor when we're thinking about forest management because of the long 
the long term and and we're not talking about maintaining a, a you know a water control structure or something that that you know needs regular physical upkeep um you know in, in some shorter time period um because forest management objectives can change over a 40 or 50 year period um assigning a, a lot of long-term o m to forest management outside of the initial establishment phase um doesn't make a lot of sense but yeah concur with nathan that we're still we still have to work through a few details internally of how exactly that's how how exactly that's phrased and formulated andy this is andrew stevenson again um uh i'm wondering if you could explain a little bit how given given the 100 year time frame for a lot of these actions to you know really assess their effectiveness um how do you see adaptive management playing a role in sort of how you approach this um mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think I think in a lot of cases with with uh, with forest management, um, adaptive management can be formulated in more of a lessons learned kind of kind of a context, um, because I think in a lot of cases, the you know the adaptive management that we would do would be in a very early phase of of a, of a of a management action. So I'm thinking of something like a you know a tree planting that in year you know, normally if the tree planting is going to fail, it's going to fail in the first four or five years. Um, and so, so adaptive management in that scenario, that would still be within the 15 year um, kind of authorization or the, the anticipated 15 year time frame of uh, NESP of the NESP authorization. And so, so, so adaptive management could be going back to one of those sites where uh, say a tree planting failed in year one and, and replanting and changing the species changing the species mix or maybe changing the, the orientation or just crossing our fingers for a better you know for a better flood year or it could also be identifying um you know site related issues or other things that may have led to that failure that may not be that we may not be able to mitigate within that site and and just um learning how to read the landscape and and the site better to improve uh future management actions um I think the when you're starting to look out at those longer and longer time frames, um, you know it, it is very difficult to predict what might happen, and so um, uh, so so adaptive management at those longer time frames, I think, is is really probably going to be more of a uh, a question of what the managers at 50 years out are are trying to do than than what we're trying to do today. Does that does that help at all, or? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. That does. There's a couple more questions, Andy, in the in the chat. Um, first one being from Andrea. If you're able to. Yep, for managing invasive insects and pathogens, more support for management planning. St. Paul Field Office has entomologists and pathologists who can assist. Thank you, Andrea. I don't think we've met yet, but I've. We we've interacted quite a bit with Linda Hogan and and uh, others in, in your office and and so um, uh, Linda Hogan of course being formerly of your office but Ryan Toot and, and others so we'll definitely we'll definitely keep that in mind um, and uh, that is a great opportunity and we're we're definitely hoping we can take advantage of those opportunities. Um, yeah. Any any other follow up on that, um, Andrea? Yeah. Yeah, just that we've had some turnover. So Linda Haugen is retired. Um, Steve Katovich just retired. Um, so we do have uh, one and some, one pathologist still, Kara Costanza, um, who could step in. And I'm always um, here, and I'm new as of last year, so I'm I'm here to assist okay. with anything that you need. So thanks. Sounds great. Yeah, we'll make sure that you're that you're looped in on um, opportunities as they come. Um, the next question, oh, the next question, um, from Greg edge, and, uh, I think Ben has followed up on a little bit of it. Um, so yeah, commercial harvesting is not a part of nest, but, um, the, you know, if we want to create conditions that are desirable for regeneration or needed, um, such as, uh, you know, creating canopy gaps with undesirable that have undesirable trees in, in those canopy gaps. I think that would fall under one of our, you know, kind of non-commercial thinning um, 
components. So it, it may be one of those things where uh, where we don't go through a commercial harvest, but we are able to do, you know, to deaden trees on site or to accomplish that same objective with a non-commercial uh, with a non-commercial approach. Um, and kind of, I think, and Ben, maybe you can hop in if, if I misspeak based on what you're trying to say here too. Um, there, you know, if 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 a if a commercial harvest is the desired option within an area, that that probably would be run through our standard ops man, operations management process rather than having that become prioritized as a um, NEST systemic forest stewardship uh, uh, action. Ben, does that kind of represent what you were what you're trying to get across there? Yeah, no, I, I think yeah, from what you said when I was right is um it we're not we're not saying that Nest for stewardship would preclude that as uh, the primary decision on the landscape. It just would not be funded and carried out through the Nest stewardship. It would be something that through operations we would carry out through a different uh process that's already in place with the Army Corps of Engineers. So yeah, I think I think you captured what I was trying to express and I think that hopefully that makes sense and is clear. Greg, does that uh, kind of answer your question or did you have anything more there? No, that's great, Andy, thanks. All right, I see, um, I see Nate, you had a comment. I'll actually, I'll go through a couple more slides um, and if we're, if it's still, if it still hasn't clarified, I think I kind of do get to that a little bit in, the, in a couple slides, so, um, uh, we can circle back to that if we need to um, a little bit later on. Um, so kind of this next section here, I'm gonna go through just the kind of our vision uh, for how the process is gonna, is, is going to be implemented or how, how, how the process is gonna work from, uh, from conceptualization to, to implementation. And, and um, we've, this is all sort of laid out within the within the appendix document itself, but I think it's um, I think it's a little bit complicated, so it's good to kind of talk through the the whole process a little bit. Um, as I've already mentioned once, um, systemic forest stewardship was envisioned in the NESP authorization of an extension of existing um, Corps of Engineers operations forest management, which has been ongoing for the last thirty or forty years um, on on the river, a little bit longer in some cases. And so the idea is that because it's an extension of ops forest management with maybe authority to work in different areas than we, we historically have been, but still the same, the same general idea, that the general process would actually be similar to our, the current coordination processes that we have within, um, within our operations uh, forest management program. And so the, the NESP systemic forest stewardship uh, process will involve kind of a local district level prioritization process um, or a regional team that's that's going to have a role in kind of visioning the program and then back to a uh, back to a district level implementation process um, and the 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 district level processes are kind of going to be just a build up of the existing the existing processes to a, to a large extent um, and then the regional forestry team is actually envisioned as being sort of a revamping of the regional forest forestry PDT that was actually established when, uh, at the time that the systemic forest stewardship plan was being developed and, and had been meeting on a regular basis up until a couple of years ago. Um, now with the reauthorization or with, with the funding that's available with NESP, um, the regional forestry team will be basically a Kind of revamping of that existing team that that's that's uh, that had been a, a smaller group previously, and I'll go through in the next few slides kind of the details of each one of these processes and, and each one of these teams. Um, so um, they're kind of they're kind of three main uh, teams that we're uh, referring to in the in the systemic forest stewardship uh, program. Um, the first are what we're calling just district forestry working groups. Um, and so at each, within each district, um, an operations lead forester um, from the core will lead um, these uh, district forestry working groups. Um, and uh, they will and include members from the partner agencies and, and 
field, uh, specifically field managers um, from those agencies as, as appropriate. Um, we're still working out the details of kind of how exactly um, individual entities will be represented in these groups, but that's kind of the general idea. Um, these district working groups will be responsible for identifying and prioritizing forest management actions um, and developing action implementation reports, AIRs, which I define a little bit later here within each one of the respective uh, Corps of Engineers districts. Um, and then those working groups further coordinate um, implementation of management actions to ensure that all um, applicable legal and policy requirements are met. Um, and kind of the process for proposing and prioritizing actions is that um, any proposed actions within the district working groups must have concurrence from the fee title federal landowner with forest management responsibilities on those lands. Um, and that's 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 important because we we really don't want to be in the situation of having uh, management actions that are proposed that haven't that haven't been vetted through the, the the federal land manager with the specific forest management responsibility for that for that parcel. Um, prioritization of actions will be conducted based on consensus, um, not voting, and so um, so it will be a discussion rather than rather than a vote to determine what what is actually what is actually prioritized within each each district. Um, but ultimately, the operations lead forester will be the one who makes the final determination based on that consensus prioritization of which actions move forward um, based on budget availability for that for that year. Um, the implementation the action implementation reports are kind of a key piece of, of the of the process. They're kind of the documentation of what the ideas are for management actions going forward. Um, and what we're referring to as management actions are kind of the base component of the ne of nest systemic forest management. Um, in some in some uh, venues, these might be called a set of management prescriptions or man forest management plan or um, uh, or a, a man or a project. In the case of systemic forest stewardship, we're, we're calling them specifically management actions. Um, and the the processes will um, will occur within each one of the within each one of the districts. They'll be they'll they will be pretty similar and they will have the same results. But there may be some nuances within each district just based on how the um, how each one of the, um, the 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 organization of the the working group um, comes together and and different management priorities in different areas. Um, action implementation reports will be developed for each prioritized action. I have an example of one of those on the next slide. Um, and then again, those action implementation reports will be selected for implementation based on budget availability in a given year. Um, and so there may be action implementation reports that are developed or management prescriptions that are prioritized within a given year that don't actually move towards implementation. And so that list of management actions will be a Rather than something like the UMARA program, where there's a, where there's you know one, two, three, four on the list, the list of actions within systemic forest stewardship will be a live list, and every year, depending on the priorities of within that year for for the various agencies and and interested partners, um, the uh, a different set of management actions off of that list may be may be selected. Um, so the action implementation report is a general document to describe the proposed management actions, um, and it, you know it has kind of the standard stuff. Where where does the where does the project the action occur within the within the the floodplain? Who, what's the ownership? Um, who's the federal fee title owner of it? Um, if there are uh, cooperating land managers or or other agreements in place for uh, cooperative management on those lands, those would be listed. Um, a list of the current conditions. Um, a key part of this is there's a management objective section that's intended to relate the management objectives of, of a given forest management action back to uh, back to the goals and objectives and desired forest conditions within the systemic forest stewardship plan. Um, and so we want to make sure that that these are linked to to higher level goals and and that we can define how they fit within the higher level goals. Um, and then kind of a general management action description, a timeline, um, and then a cost estimate, and then a, a supplemental map and, and perhaps a few photos. These are really meant to be um, very high level, um, low detail documents that just give a general idea of, of what's, what's going on 
with with the action. Um, one thing, um, and I you know mentioned this a little bit when we were kind of chatting a little bit about O and M. Um, timeline is timeline is really important. My dog's about to go off because the doorbell rang, so forgive me for that for a moment. But um, so the uh, the timeline component of this is very important because um, we want to make sure that we're incorporating all the management actions that are associated with um, with implementation uh, of the establishment phase of these actions. Um, and so uh, we'll be thinking, you know, four or five or six years down the road in some cases, rather than just one or two years. Um, and I I already mentioned this, but ARRs may be developed when actions are added to the master list, or they may be developed once actions are prioritized. Um, I'm sure there's a question from Matt Mangan that I'll address quick, and then um, Andrew, I'm assuming that's you from UMRBA, I'll, I'll get to you next. So, um, Matt, yeah, so Matt, the, we, we do have a template action implementation report. Um, and we're, it's, it's in a draft format. And so part of the review process of the, um, of the, uh, the appendix will be to get feedback on that, um, on that, that action implementation report document, um, and hopefully make sure that it kind of meets the specifications that, that partners need. Um, and, and there'll be an opportunity as well for the regional forestry team to kind of provide some feedback on that. Um, Andrew, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, uh, I guess I was, I was looking at this, and you're talking about the uh, objectives for management actions. And if I recall from earlier slides, that sort of wildlife habitat uh, or wildlife management was one of those main goals or objectives, sort of for the overall uh, plan. Um, is there any monitoring that can be supported uh, through any of these projects? You know, I, I recall that there was the floodplain forest avian stewardship plan that was sort of derived mm -hmm. after, and it was really particular to the St. Louis district, I think, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, could, can you speak to that at all in terms of what we might be capable of, you know? Yeah, so, so you're asking specific, specifically about wildlife monitoring. Yeah, in relationship to our forest, you know, habitat. Yeah, history. you know, I, that's a good question. Actually, I think that's something that we really haven't, we really haven't, talked through we've talked quite a bit about vegetation monitoring and so i think that's probably a question that we should put on our list of things to follow up on um so i don't i don't think that i have a good answer right now for you for you on that andrew we'll, we'll we will definitely follow up on that okay thanks all right um any other questions on on kind of the teams or the process or the action implementation reports Okay, so I'll next couple of slides will uh, describe kind of the the regional forestry team and then the associated um, science team. Um, and so the primary purpose of the regional forestry team um, is we really like this term to serve as the steward of the systemic forest stewardship plan, um, and and streamline it now that we we are working with Nest systemic forest stewardship to you know to get that focus on on the. Um, development and implementation of the NEST systemic forest stewardship um, element. Um, the regional forestry team won't be reviewing or prioritizing action implementation reports, but will be instead um, a venue for sharing lessons learned and best practices from implementation of forest management actions. Um, and so, so again, it's it's really more about um, information gathering, data sharing, um, and improving processes rather than necessarily being an entity that's going to make that's going to be a decision making body to um, to determine which actions are implemented and which which are not. Um, and the the regional forestry team will be made up of representatives from uh, from a range of uh, different entities. Um, but a really key component of those the individuals that are on the regional forestry team is that they should be people who have um, sufficient expertise in forest ecology and management um, that can be applied. Um, to the discussions of um, of systemic forest stewardship plan updates and um, and action implementation report um, development, and I will say here too that we we're still um, we still have a couple questions in terms of how exactly the the um, 
representation on the regional forestry team uh, will be laid out and what are um, what we're able to do in our current um, in the in the current um, legal framework for the regional forestry team and so there may be some questions um, about who and how that works and we're probably going to have to um, put those questions on our list of questions to follow up on because I think there's still a few details that we need to work out about exactly how the the regional forestry team is formulated in terms of in terms of membership. Um, but what the team will specifically work on is determining overarching goals and objectives for um, NESP systemic forest stewardship in the context of the steward systemic stewardship plan, um, ensuring that forest management action implementation under systemic forest stewardship is consistent with the goals and objectives of developing a framework for updating the systemic stewardship plan as new information becomes available. Um, developing a process for annual progress reporting on implementation of, of the, the systemic forest stewardship element um, and including reporting on status of effectiveness uh, um, of active or completed action implementation reports and then providing guidance to the science team to develop applied research priorities and apply that new in information to implementation. Um, and I'll note here too that within the, within the appendix we don't really clearly define the structure of the regional forestry team and that's somewhat intentional. Um, the, the goal is to have the regional forestry team kind of define uh, some of the processes itself and in, in some of the initial the initial meetings and so a lot of a few the initial meetings the regional forestry team will kind of be focused on um, coming to an understanding of how um, how those responsibilities are going to be um, are going to be uh, met by by that team. Um, and so uh, so again, we may not have a lot of specific specific answers for questions about how the regional forestry team is is going to be laid out. And if that's something that we need to have more detail on, we we will definitely work on that. Um, kind of then the last part of the process is this implementation phase, and Leanne covered quite a bit of, quite a bit of this already. Um, once we have management implementation report. Uh, our management action reports in place, um, we will um, incorporate those with more detailed site level management prescriptions that will then be routed through our um, respective environmental compliance offices for review um, and and any additional environmental compliance work that would need to be that would need to be done um, per uh, federal regulation or policy um, and then once those uh, once those compliance reviews are completed, the uh, management actions will be implemented via um, contracts awarded and managed managed by the Corps, but potentially with support from from partners in doing quali contract quality assurance or other components of the of the contract um, uh, on the ground management as as available or as needed. Um, and then finally, the science team uh, one really unique aspect and really uh, really um, positive aspect I think of, the, of systemic forest stewardship is that applied research was specifically defined as a um, as a key component of NESP systemic forest stewardship and so um, there is a specific need for kind of a science team within within the regional forestry team to be able to provide um, you know informal scientific insight into um, to the to the team that facilitates that applied research um, component of of systemic forest stewardship, um, and you know science science team members may participate in the, RF, the regional forestry team meetings, and they'll play a key role in helping develop key or science based objectives and quantitative management criteria within the updates to the systemic stewardship plan. Um, and, and basically that team will be kind of identified via the, the regional forestry team in terms of, of what the, the applied research um, objectives and information needs uh, needs are related that that team can contribute to. Um, I will stop right here. I have the, the figure up of kind of that whole process um, before kind of starting on my last set of slides here related to kind of timelines and all that sort of thing. Um, any further questions here related to any of the teams or um, or the process? Hey Andy, this is Andrew uh, with the RPA again. Um, what uh, 
if any interaction do you see between sort of the regional forestry team and this whole process and the NESP uh, CC, the, the state representatives and such? In, in terms of, um, in terms of like reach level planning or in terms of uh, the involvement of, of, the, of specific entities on the, on the teams? Uh, reach a level planning, and then as we think about like sort of out your budget scenarios that that group generally discusses a bit more, and sort of what's the appropriate mm -hmm. amount to spend on an annual year for forestry work under this, and you know, there's, there's a variety of things that I think I could think about in, in tying yeah. to that group. But I, I think on a previous presentation, you know, that we had talked about this a while, a few months ago, there's a connection because we were thinking about it and how it related to the reach or to the to the project selection process, and we've sort of moved it away from that um so i guess yeah yes yeah. yeah, so, so so i think there there are a couple pieces here and maybe you know jill you might want to jump in if 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 need be at some point here but i think you know we 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 haven't thought in a lot of detail exactly how the how the how a systemic forest stewardship is will jive with kind of the larger nest um ecosystem component but we've we fully anticipate that somebody from the systemic forest forestry planning team will be um, participating at some level within some of the um, higher level management discussions to be able to at least provide kind of those those higher level updates as to where things are at with systemic forest stewardship um, and to be able to um, you know to to provide that feedback in terms of what priorities are and what objectives are and yeah execution of budgets and what's you know what's been going well what hasn't what's been accomplished that kind of a thing um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, there will be. It, it, I guess that's that's the main, the main um, area that we've actually talked about. I think there's there's probably a lot of space for us to talk a little bit more now that we're we, we're a little closer to understanding what the process is for systemic forestry. Kind of starting to talk a little bit more about how that integrates with with everything else. Because you're right, we need to make sure that we're not that that there's that the that the two that the program the elements within the program are communicating well with each other and that the information is being shared adequately um in spite of the fact there's a little bit different framework for systemic forest stewardship um jill do you have anything else or or nathan anything else to add to that Yeah, Andy, I, I mean, I think you summarized it pretty well. I mean, there's probably some details to work out there in terms of, you know, how the information is shared, you know, up, down, and sideways. Um, Got to work out. But, um, yeah, I mean, in the end, I think you, you kind of summarize where we're at. So I'm good. Hey, Andy, this is Sabrina Chandler of Fish and Wildlife. Um, with regard to the programmatic EA. Um, obviously, you know, based on the discussion here, we're talking about managing forest on on core fee title lands, fish and wildlife fee title lands uh, under that federal umbrella. The programmatic EA is intended to cover environmental compliance requirements for both of those. I assume. Um, is there a way for us to plug into that? NEPA effort and and be a part of that so that that we can make sure that that we're meeting all the needs or is there more to it than that? Yeah, I think I'll I'll let maybe let Leanne answer that question um, if you're all right with that, Leanne. Actually, I was going to defer that to Steve. <laughs> or, or to Steve. <laughs> I kind of thought so. Uh, yeah, Sabrina, we can look into that. Um, we're just in the process of still developing that PEA, um, but I understand what you're saying. You guys want to be able to use it for your compliance as well, so we can discuss a process for for review. And I don't know if you guys would want to sign your own Fonzie for it or whatnot, but but we can get there. Okay, yeah, I think we'd be really interested in being involved in that so that we're not duplicating effort. Any other questions at this point? 
you've almost made it through. I've, I think I've, I've got five or six more slides, maybe. Maybe not even that many. Um, all right. So kind of the last little bit, um, just general annual timelines. And again, this, this is something that um, actually isn't, um, isn't defined within the, the appendix, but, but we figured that probably people are going to, you know, want to have at least some general idea of this. Um, to date, we, to date, we've been kind of, you know, as we've been developing the, the, the appendix in the process, we've been also, you know, just trying to, trying to get some dollars executed. And so the process has been pretty, uh, pretty squishy and pretty nebulous, but I think our goal generally, and this will, this will develop a bit over the next, you know, the next couple of months is that, um, that every year, kind of early fall uh, of each fiscal year, that the district forest working groups would meet to um, review current the current potential forest management action list and um, identify top priority actions, um, trying to pull together um, that that fiscal year's action implementation reports um, uh, by by mid to late fall, so that um, and have those reviewed to relative to budget availabilities as as we know what it is, um, and then hopefully have a regional forestry team meeting sometime in that fall winter time frame in which we'd be able to um, in, in which we'd be able to present those action implementation reports to regional forestry team and discuss you know lessons learned and and move forward with the regional forestry team uh, process. Um, then uh, by kind of midwinter of each fiscal year, so maybe January, February, March, sort of a time frame, aiming to have environmental compliance complete for any of the current fiscal year actions, so that we can try to have um, scopes of work to to contracting for award for for new management actions or new contract actions by um, you know by early spring of each each fiscal year to try to keep out of the uh, the log jam that ends up happening at the end of the fiscal year with with contracting, um, you know, this this will obviously vary a little bit depending on the year. But I think what we're hoping to do once we get this pro this process established is that a lot of these meeting dates will become kind of pretty well set to where um, where we know that these are going to be happening at a certain period in time and and to be ready with with our our management actions as appropriate. Um, and what I think what's really important is the cycle will repeat each year, um, and you know every year we'll have probably new management actions added to our lists and new action implementation reports developed that may not go forward to implementation. Um, and so the actions that are on the list from prior years may be put forward and prioritized, or you know new actions may come up that that may be prioritized as part of this process. Um, and then the, the actual contracting process um, may differ slightly between core districts, just based on our contracting procedures, and and some of the timelines may may vary accordingly. Again, this this timeline is just kind of pretty really um, couldn't was pretty it's pretty general at this point in time, and I think we'll be working through this over the next couple couple of, of weeks and 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 month or two. So hopefully we'll have have it hammered out a little bit more. Um, as we get really into starting to think about FY25 um, actions. Um, any comments on the timeline before I get into my last, uh, my last two slides here? We'll definitely we'll definitely seek feedback from from all the partners on 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 those timelines as as we're as we're going forward and developing them a little bit more. Um, so I guess the last the last little piece that I wanted to emphasize that that um, uh, that we've identified as additional components within within the the appendix or or key components of of moving the program forward. Um, as I've mentioned already, the systemic forest stewardship plan update is a is a key part of this. Um, within this, within the stewardship plan, it's um, identified as that it's intended to function as a living document and be reviewed and updated every five to ten years. So we're definitely due to do for an update anyhow. Um, and current update will probably end up focusing on kind of integration of a lot of important new data sets like the systemic forest inundation model, systemic forest succession model, a, more, a very much more comprehensive forest inventory data set. Um, and you know a handful of other data sets that that are really valuable that weren't available 12 years ago. Um, 
we have with a lot more inventory data that we have available and a, a lot more of that comprehensive data we also have the opportunities for doing a lot more detailed summaries of the existing conditions which will allow us to develop more locally relevant management guidelines and desired forest conditions um, a lot of the the desired forest conditions that are described within the systemic forest stewardship plan were based largely on condition on a set of um, desired forest conditions that were identified in the lower Mississippi um, uh, joint venture um, uh, habitat management plan. I can't remember the name of the exact document, but they were were not were largely not based on data that was that was collected and and summarized for the UMR. And so there's a great opportunity to really um, refine those metrics and develop a more comprehensive set of metrics that will be really helpful for, um, for guiding management going forward. Um, again, the, the applied research component is a, is a, is a huge component of, of, uh, of systemic forest stewardship, and we really want to make sure that we take advantage of that. Um, really looking at uh, continued evaluation of existing implementation techniques and development of new techniques. Um, kind of defining priority research needs that will help to inform management and a, and a research framework to get there. Um, and one, one thing that we've talked about a little bit um, in, in the past is potentially having a, uh, a, a meeting at some point in the, in, the, in the relatively near future to bring together agency staff and researchers to kind of synthesize where we're at with current, current floodplain forest research and, and how that's applicable to nest systemic forest stewardship and, you know, potentially other um, other forest management and to begin the process of, of developing that research framework. Um, and then kind of the other thing, the systemic forest stewardship plan identified a number of data needs um, and we want to circle back to those data needs and kind of uh, uh, hone in on some that we haven't addressed yet and, and kind of move forward with some that we already have. Um, a, a, a large number of the data sets that were identified within the systemic stewardship plan were, we do have data now, but a lot of them we, we would definitely like to continue um, to update. Uh, forest inventory, I've already mentioned. Um, continuous forest inventory is a, is a key part of uh, being able to implement um, NESP systemic forest stewardship effectively. Um, a huge piece that NESP systemic forest stewardship is really going to be able to help with, we hope, is development, further development of our forest management geo database, which is the tool set that we use for actually summarizing and evaluating the forest inventory data. Um, and there's been a there's been a lot of good progress that's been done over the last couple of years on that. But um, the systemic forest stewardship funding really gives us a, a great opportunity to take that from a you know from a from a kind of an ad hoc project to something that's really a baked in component of of, of forest management and and data forest data management on the Mississippi. Um, and there are a number of other things listed on, on that list. Um, I, I don't need to go through every one of them, but um, data, data collection and data needs are, are, are a key component of, of systemic forest stewardship to inform the ultimate management actions. Um, I think that might be my last slide, so I will, I will stop there. I don't know, Dan, if you want to take over and do the last couple slides, and then I can take any remaining questions or... I could take questions right now. Why don't I just take questions right now? I think we have a little bit of time left, so. Hey, Andy, Sabrina again. Kind of related to an earlier question about, you know, where where these projects would be applicable based on ownership. Uh, the, the line item there, the geo database development, could could that serve that function as well, or or is that intended to be more site specific with uh, action items? Um, what what are you thinking there? Yeah, the, the forest management geodatabase is kind of intended to be our you know to be our be all and end all for forest management data. So right now it primarily in in houses um, the all of the the inventory plots that have been collected as part of the uh, using our phase two forest inventory protocol. Um, but as part of that process, it includes a, um, a kind of a management level hierarchy as well as uh, as well as landowner um, or, or manager component. So I believe that um, that the uh, the master plan land classification data, if it's not integrated yet, it will be integrated at some point 
uh, in the relatively near future into that. Um, and so that that will be one, I think, one place where where that that data will be available. Um, I don't, Chris, I don't know if you want, Chris Haas is the uh, developer for the FMG who's I think on the call. I don't know if you have any if you have any additional comment on that, Chris. I don't, Andy, still I think on. you, yep, can you hear me? Yep. I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, you know, kind of the, the main thrust right now is taking over 15 years of data, consolidating it, and starting to expand the framework to really handle um, a much more comprehensive catalog of management actions. Um, anyway, more to come on that. We're kind of still in early days on on prototyping what that application and information system looks like. So, so a follow up of of that. So, so it sounds like the master plan shape shape files would be incorporated into that. And the master plan includes, uh, you know, all of the state managed lands, the GP lands, uh, general plan lands, and and the fish and wildlife fee title, core fee title, all of those things in one place, but. Currently, as you mentioned, that's divided by district. Is this geo database intended to be, you know, all three districts, or is it going to be three different geo databases, one for each district? No, yeah, the, the geo database is intended to be a regional consolidated forest forest management geo database, and so um, <clears throat> it was. The, the initial framework was actually developed by St. Louis District. Rock Island has kind of taken the lead the last couple of years in um, kind of modernizing it. And we're really right now, I think Chris right now is actually working with both St. Louis District data and St. Paul District data to get get all three districts integrated into a regional database. And, and yeah, that, that is the ultimate goal is to have a single database where you can where you can zoom in on Hastings, Minnesota, or St. Louis, Missouri, and and see what you know what the forest condition is in that in that individual location. There, there's there's a lot of development to go to get there, but we're we're on a really good path to get there. Excellent. Thank you for that. I got well, one maybe more Dan, question. I'll, Sorry, I'll, uh, one more question related to compliance. And I know you mentioned the, the programmatic agreement uh, earlier for cultural resources. Is that the overall NES programmatic agreement for 106, or is there a separate programmatic agreement specifically for the forestry consultation part? Steve or Leanne, I'll let you, I'll let you hop in on that one too. Vanessa was on the call. Oh, Vanessa maybe as well. Uh, not, yes. I'm not seeing. Did, oh, go ahead. Are you asking for this Vanessa? Oh, no, no I think Vanessa, the other Vanessa. And I don't, it looks like she's maybe not on the call anymore. If it's the programmatic agreement that Vanessa with the core is leading for the overall NESP, and I think maybe even UMRR compliance, that, and we're plugged into that. I just want to make sure there wasn't a separate one specifically related. Oh, no, that's the one. Okay. All right. Thanks for that clarification. All right. Well, that's all I've got. Um, definitely, if you want to keep on asking questions in the chat or, you know, as we're wrapping up here, I can certainly answer more, but um, maybe I'll hand it back over to, to Dan or Nathan or whoever's going to. Yeah, I, I can take it, Andy, if you want to make me the presenter. I got to figure out how to do that. I guess I just, there we go. Got right. it. Yep. So I just have a couple slides on um, um, taking review. We want to hear from everyone. Um, so we're going to ask that comments be submitted by members of the public or organizations and agencies 
by March 4th. Um, this is roughly 30 days um, for everyone to kind of talk internally and, and, and collect your, your comments. And uh, if you could, when you do respond um, with those comments, um, that you email it to the email provided in this slide. Um, the nest.ecos.stp at useace.army.mil. Um, we'll use this um, email as kind of the, the hub where we will collect all the comments and uh, consolidate and then start filtering through and, and talking internally um, within the core and, and, and going through them. Um, for organizations and agencies, um, if you could, um, in the appendix, I, I did send out a draft appendix um, w with this uh, meeting invite. If you could, uh, one per, per organization would be preferred um, if you could go through and, and, and actually make your comments in that Word document and then attach that to the, to the email um, when you respond by March 4th would be great, greatly appreciated. And then uh, just the last slide, um, we are, you know, we, we are asking for comments by March 4th, but we are targeting April 1st of this year as our tentative date to have a final appendix um, that incorporates all the agency and public comment. Um, and again, after this meeting, there will be follow-up uh, meeting notes. Um, there will be, uh, again, this, this meeting was recorded, so we'll provide um, that link to this, to this meeting. And um, also there'll be some, some more information on uh, some um, timelines and, and comment responses um, for the agencies um, after this meeting. And with that, we're we're at the end, and kind of leave it open to everyone for any last minute questions or um, anyone would like to to bring up. Oh, when can we expect that link? I'm going to go ahead and guess that um, we should expect that early next week. I'd, I'd guess Monday. Um, I think many of us are in the attending the FWIG meeting tomorrow in Lacrosse, but I would I would suspect um, either tomorrow or, or early next week. Brenda. Hey Dan, uh, some of the things that were discussed today, would you need those in uh, comments to, would you need those comments to be submitted? So some of the questions we asked about, you know, if, uh, if wildlife monitoring could be supported through the systemic forest stewardship plan in any way, like those types of questions, are you going to be pulling them from the discussion today through meeting minutes or, or something like that? or? Yep, I've I've captured that, Andrew. Um, I know me and Nathan have have been writing down comments, and we'll we'll talk after this and consolidate with our notes, so that is captured. But you know, if if you there's nothing wrong with you also submitting that in that email, just so that we have it, you know, hard copied in in email too. There's there's nothing wrong with that. But it is we I have been writing down as we've been talking today, uh, questions that have been asked and. Um, um, planning on follow up with it, but to answer your question, um, if, if you would like to send it in an email, there's, there's, you, you can. No. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna take silences. Not that I don't, is any of the core people, anyone's hands up? I don't see any. All right, well, I guess if, if there are no further questions, um, like I said, there will be a follow-up email to this meeting um, with, um, with meeting minutes and um, uh, a link to this, to this recorded meeting and um, there will be a follow-up, follow-up emails to everyone on this meeting and appreciate everyone calling in and um, I thought it was a really productive meeting and discussions and um, appreciate everyone logging on. Hey, thanks everybody.